Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Evans Journal, and I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing today? Yeah, you know, day uh, day 597 of Groundhog Day is uh, just like yesterday and the day before, with a little bit worse ending because the Oilers lost. 6-4 uh, to the Winnipeg oh, Jets. Yeah, 6-4 to the Jets. The Oilers just can't get to 500, Bruce. Like, they're... With it, twice now they've been within one game of getting to one win of getting back to real 500 in the NHL and they're just not three able times. to do it and now they're three times and now they're um, two games below again they're they really they're, you know got to win the next one of course anyway they deserve to lose tonight I thought they I thought they were outplayed by the Winnipeg Jets um, the the great A chances were 14 to nine for the Jets and although the Oilers had a three one lead in the first it was all on kind of uh, power play and uh, goals, and they didn't. The owners certainly didn't dominate that period or or look much like the better team. And then as the game went along, the Jets pulled away. So, kind of a disheartening game. What did you think of it? Yeah, well, I mean, the power play was what got built the two goal lead. They went two for two in the power play early in the game and then the refs decided they better not give Edmonton any more power plays tonight. And that was it for the night, two for two. And they really could have used another chance at some point. But uh, uh, so that that aside, I mean, Winnipeg took it to them for large parts of the second period and then completely took over in the first part of the third period. And Edmonton looked like a bad hockey team for, for the first 10 minutes of the third period. They were second best in a whole lot of different categories. Yeah, so uh, we'll get into it. Two good things, two bad things, and two numbers. Bruce, what is your good thing? Uh, I'm going to go with the second Oilers goal, the the one they got at even strength in the first period, and this was a play where uh, uh, Patrick Russell basically played uh, pretty close to perfect hockey for about 20 or 25 seconds where his, his line was caught out on a defensive shift, uh, but uh, uh, he helped make the defensive play that finally broke the cycle at the blue line. Then he made a nice outlet pass to Kara. Kara got it to center and dumped it in, and the line headed off for a change, but Russell kept going, and he went right into the corner with the idea, I think, of I'll just go in battle for the puck long enough for the reinforcements to get here. Well, he went all the way to the end board, and he got on top of that disc and he, and he just held it off, held it off, held it off while the reinforcements did in fact arrive. But Russell himself wound up winning the puck battle, moving it along the end wall and making the centering pass that Adam Larson buried from uh, uh, just top of the, of the face-off circle center point. And just, you know, it was just a heady play and, a, you know, a good sort of diligent, hard-working play by, um, by Patrick Russell. And you wouldn't expect a goal on that type of play one time in 50, but this happened to be that time. Um, but there was, he basically did nothing wrong. You know, like if his, his being the third guy on the line change, it's the sort of thing that if he went deep and lost the battle, he could easily swoop by and change at the bench on the way back, knowing he had two fresh line mates out there with his back. So just the kind of sound, diligent hockey that, I'd sure like to see a whole lot more of out of the third and fourth lines. <sighs> Bruce, uh, on that goal, uh, I like Drysaddle the way he was uh, mm-hmm. banging in there uh, and knocking those Jets demon around with the uh, kind of a cross check, if we're completely honest. And that helped sh- shake the pot mm-hmm. loose. But that really was a diligent play by Patrick Russell, who, who if nothing else, knows how to work the boards. He's very good at oh. it. And um, it stood out tonight. Yeah. That that line, Bruce. Oh. Um, he was easily the best player on the line, and um, you know it's funny because the Oilers had a functional fourth line uh, against Toronto. They had a they got a really good game out of Archibald, uh, Devon Shore, and um, and Chason. But we haven't seen Alex Chason since then. He's been not in the lineup. James Neal has, and I just wonder why. Like you you had a fourth line that actually was maybe your best line that game. And we haven't seen it since then. So I hope we see it next game because the owners got that goal out of the fourth line. 
but um, as we'll find out in a sh- short time later, we're, we're haunted by mistakes by that line. And, and all game, Bruce, whenever they were out there, I was on just worried that they were going to get scored on because they, they had very little zone time. Do you know what the shots were when they were out there? They were just... Um, just, just looking that up now. Uh, uh, four shot attempts for 10 against for Kara. Well, yeah. the actual shots on net were only three to four. I feel so, sorry for the defensemen are out there when 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 that fourth line is out there because it's just so hard to do anything with those guys. They're just <sighs> so my my good thing, Bruce. I'm going to just go. It wasn't Connor McDavid's best game. Obviously, he uh, was a culprit on Lowry's goal. He, you know, he Connor McDavid's been playing very strong defense this year, but he did get. You know, you're going to lose puck battles now and then, and he was fighting Lowry. Uh, but got beat to the net. But the good thing was the two skill plays that he made oh. on scoring plays. Um, his pass on the power play to Nugent Hopkins, cross seam, I think he was on the backhand of McDavid was, if I'm not mistaken, yep. was a beauty. was an absolutely beautiful pass, and it created mm-hmm. that goal. And then his goal uh, to, to bring the Oilers within one goal with two minutes left was absolutely fantastic. Coming in on the wing like that, stick handling, and just – just firing it into the top corner like that. As uh, the famous uh, Edmonton youth coach, adult coach Jim Fleming says, shot it where your mama keeps the cookies. And uh, <laughs> the only frustrating have, thing, Bruce, was... Go ahead. I was going to say, after breaking Mark Scheifele's ankles out near the blue line with a <laughs> with a spinorama, that's the reason why he was able to walk into the slot like that. Well, Scheifele was lying on the ice trying to pick up his jock. Amazing play, just an amazing play by Connor McDavid, and we're so used to it that we don't even remark on it. So I just thought tonight that that'll be my good thing. There wasn't a lot to love about oh. the Oilers' performance that game, and one of them, like Tippett, didn't call. I, you know, you, you just score a goal. You've got the two best players in the world. Um, put him on the bench so we can put Kyle Turris out there. Yeah, let's get Kyle Turris out there again and see what happens. And and so why not call a time? I think they right. could have called a timeout then. Why didn't they, Bruce? And and why not rest up McDavid at that point and get him out there? I guess maybe you're. I don't know. I'm. I was thinking maybe you'd get him out there with a minute and twenty left, and then you want to use your timeout later. Same but reason not, you kick a field goal when you're down by eight with two minutes left. Sometimes <sighs> we just kind of wonder what's going on in the in between the ears of the people making the decisions, but. I didn't get that, but anyway, that's my good thing. What's your bad thing? <laughs> yeah, your good thing. Yeah, McDavid did make those two great plays. I didn't think he had a very great game, though. He was really not he feeling it tonight. Like he was the previous two games. I thought he was outstanding, but tonight, uh, not so much. Uh, bad things, bad things. Where to begin? Uh, I think i got to I got to go back to that third line. You know, they, and they were saying, they were saying nice things on the broadcast about uh, about Zach Cassian, and he was skating well and getting chances, um, largely when Leon Dreisaitl was setting him up. Leon set up Cassian three different times with fantastic passes, and Zach wasn't able to convert any of those opportunities. But that line, the three veterans, uh, 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 Turris and Neil and Cassian got badly outshot, anywhere between eight to three against and ten to four against. And Turris wound up with a dash three on the night, and uh, uh, the other two guys dash one, and that's the third line. And uh, I expect you're going to talk about the fourth line, and they also basically wound up with dash one, other than Patrick Russell, who on the line change was able to be involved in a goal, but. Uh, it's just the same old story that the uh, uh, that the uh, third line's getting caved. Oh, and I, I know we weren't going to do two bad things, but I forgot what my bad thing was going to be. Chris Russell getting burned on three different goals tonight. Two on the penalty kill where he was not effective, and a third one at even strength. And he just got, I think, six chances against on the game, and he just wasn't feeling it tonight either. So I suspect there'll be a change on left defense next game. That's my prediction. Two of the goals when Torres was out there came by the guy he was supposed to be covering. Mm-hmm. And this is getting to be a little bit, we're seeing this a little bit much, Bruce. It's the Torres triangle out there. Which I've made my early assessment of him pretty clear. What's your thought on the player? 
Uh, not not strong enough defensively, and not particularly. You know, I don't see him as a natural penalty killer. Like they've kind of stuck him into that role because they don't have a lot of choices there, having uh, you know bailed on uh, Ron Riley Shane. And uh, he's been their first choice on the penalty kill, and he's been getting lit up. I think one of his minuses is they scored exactly two minutes at the end of the penalty, but it was, as you say, his man uh, who popped the puck into the net. And it was just, to my eye, poor coverage. So, Yeah, and then on the uh, fourth goal, the go-ahead goal, he was just outworked in the slot by a player and... Yeah, Bruce, I don't know what to say other than the Oilers have a major, major problem at center ice right now. They they have two of them. And Gaetan Haas, we can hope when Gaetan Haas comes back that he'll be at full speed, um, you know, over COVID and ready to go mm-hmm. because they really need him. They need him to be what, like last year he was a decent fourth line center. Even if they get that out of him, Bruce, Um yeah. That'll be a that'll be a positive because because you never he might be able to work his way up from that because right now that position is just a black hole uh, sucking in the Oilers playoff hopes as we're going along because they're they're down a goal or two a game because of that position so uh, center, center position specifically yeah they center got two, position they got two good well, ones and then they got third a- and fourth line center third and fourth line center position. Not the not the top, not the position overall, right. but they've got they go from the two of the best centers in the NHL, they're the, the two best centers possibly mm-hmm. to two of the least effective right now at this point. And again, I, I said this last game, so I will say it again because it is still early. Taurus, this is this is a veteran player who's had success elsewhere. It's early in the season, although we're eight games into it, and um, he still may crank it up, but he's got to get he's got to get stronger on his stick. And just make up his mind that he will not get beat in the defensive slot. Um, that can't happen with the regularity that that it's happening. My my bad thing, Bruce, is the was the tying goal. Edmonton was cruising along in that game, even though they weren't the better team. They were hanging in there. It was kind of an even game, probably up to that point, uh, pretty much. Outcomes, and you know, they were playing the the top three lines quite a bit uh, early in the third period. And I think this was the first shift for the fourth line. And they're in there on the four check, and and you know, Kara's doing his his usual um, whatever, and and he, a, a pass, a stretch pass goes right through him, right through him, mm-hmm. you know, way up ice. And Chris Russell's backed way off, giving up the blue line. And uh, Josh Archibald's tracking back, but he's not fast enough. Fast enough, and Tyson Berry wipes out in, in defense. But it was really the the. the you know, the the play all happens with Kara and Russell allowing that, you know, a deadly zone entry um, because Russell's back too far and Kara doesn't do his job stopping that stretch pass. And uh, it was just another example of the Oilers losing a game because at even strength, the third and the fourth line are getting scored on. And... Um, they have lots of options back there. I mean, they could play Negard. I think Negard's a responsible defensive player. I'd have him out there. Uh, they could get Chase on back in the lineup if he's healthy. Like I'm, mis- I don't know why he hasn't been playing. I mean, I think James Neal actually. I, I've liked James Neal's energy and the way he's playing, so I don't have a problem with Neal or or with Cassian, even though he gave the puck away to start the sequence of pain on the winning goal. Um, well, it was yeah, that was the winning goal. Um, I don't mind Neil and, but I, it's just, I don't know. I, I guess they need Archibald out there to kill penalties, but he's not doing much right now either. Um, it's, it's it's a tough situation, Bruce, because the real hole is at center and they only have, I guess they have Shore and Haas. I wouldn't, I'd rather see them, like them next game. If if Haas is healthy, I'd rather see them next game than Kara and Turris. I'd not. sit He's not it, yeah. Supposed to be still at least a week away, they're saying. So I'm not sure what he's dealing with, but uh, it's not good. No. What's your Kyle number? Tur- Kyle Turris, well, this this isn't it, but it could be it. Uh, minus eight through eight games. Minus eight already. And he's and the thing is, is this games. is a very probably kind of a, an earned minus eight where he has been responsible on a lot of those goals against. So it's not just out there, but... In the middle tied, of so. tied for the worst in the league. 
Wow. Yeah. So wow. It made me made me by the end of the night I was thinking, where are they is Riley Shayan available? Can, nope. can we get him back? He got signed by Buffalo. Yeah. I know. Do they keep him? Are they playing him? Yeah, See he got a goal the other night. Can we trade for him? Uh, Shayan was a better it. player than Turris is right now. Like, at least Shayan could kill penalties. So, Bruce, what's your number? Carson Barry at minus six. Uh, I'm just going to pull, pull one out of the air on uh, face-offs tonight. Oilers, 23 face-off wins, 33 losses. And I was noticing time and again they were starting without the puck. And, they'd, you know, they'd work and they'd earn an offensive zone draw. And then they'd lose the draw and Winnipeg would just walk out with the puck. Here are the individual uh, stats for that. Kyle Turris, four wins, nine losses, 31%. Jujar Kara, two wins, nine losses, 18%. Leon Dreisaitl, 14 wins, 7 losses, 67%. Connor McDavid, 2 wins, 7 losses, 22%. So three of the four lines were starting without the puck. And Dreisaitl at least was good in the circle. I didn't think he had a great game, but he sure made some nice passes. And he scored a, he scored a decent <laughs> goal. But uh, uh, the Oilers need their two big stars to be on overdrive, apparently, to have a chance to win because the other weaknesses on the team are just too big at this moment. This is a very discouraging game, in my view. Well, they were really outplayed. You know, they really were. And um, a three-one lead against a team playing its sixth game in nine nights. Put your foot on their throats. Take it to them and beat them. You know, where was that? I mean, Winnipeg was the more desperate team tonight, and I just don't understand. I mean, at a certain point, I mean, you got to get to five hundred to get over five hundred, and you got to get over five hundred if you want to have a prayer getting in the playoffs. And the longer you wait. Like even if they win the next sweep the next series, they're only five and five, which is only you know five hundred, which is that and five hundred is like five sixty, right? You'll make the playoffs at five hundred though, even in the Canadian There's, division this year. Well, if you're fifty, if you're real five hundred, yeah, no, yeah, real five hundred. Well, this yeah. is five wins, five losses, and zero um, uh, extra points is subpar in the NHL. That's what I'm saying. So they got they got to somehow get ahead of the curve, and it would help to play two decent games in a row and win them both. Hasn't happened yet. At least the second part. My number is 29.01. That's the ice time that Darnell Nurse had to ta- had tonight, and he was on the ice. It was 22.37 even strength. The other lefty... Russell, 13 minutes at even strength, and Jones, 14 minutes at even strength. I thought Jones actually came back and played well, well enough that he should be in the lineup next game. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Russell comes out and Cuckoo goes in. That would be my pick as well. Um, Depending on who are they playing, is it the Flames? They're playing the Leafs. uh, Two two at home, and then they play Thursday, Saturday against the Leafs, and then Sunday and Tuesday against the Senators, and then they finally got a couple days off. Well, so. they did play well. Russell did play well against the Leafs in Toronto, I'll give him that. So um, that might complicate the decision a little bit. But so did Cuckoo. Um, I, mm. I think Russell could use it, probably use a night off. Any, anyway, that's a lot of ice time for Darnell Nurse. And he was minus three on the night. Um, he made, he, he wasn't the, like, the most, wretched culprit on out there by a long oh. shot but he did make four major mistakes on grade a chances against which is way too many for a defenseman you like one or two you think okay well that's it's tough playing defense in the nhl that's going to happen to every defenseman every game but four that's getting up there into oh territory and ethan bear also struggled a little bit or are they being overused nurse on the power play um they did score the two goals um, I didn't mind Barry on the power play. Honestly, I think he, I think they should, if they're going to have him, go back to that, or play Bouchard, you know, instead of Barry if he's just going to be at even strength. Although I don't mind, like I know he's minus six, but I haven't minded Tyson Barry at even strength. I think he's been okay. But why not play Bouchard? Because then you have someone to play on your power play. You don't have to play Nurse 29, 29 minutes a game. Uh, I heard that Bouchard might be. He's got a back issue, Tippett got said today. A back so, uh, issue? Oh, okay. That's why they people were expecting he might be the one activated, and Tippett kind of just said he's not available to us at this time. Something wrong with his back. Old man Bouchard, I guess, has got back pain. So, 
So Barry, ah. you talk about Barry at even strength, and you know I like a fair bit of his game, but uh, uh, I don't think he's all that good in front of his own net. He loses a lot of strength battles and so on, and and uh, yeah. there's lots of times where he winds up kind of laying on the ice while the puck's going in the net because. Anyway. Strength and reach, strength and reach battles. So um, mm-hmm. we'll see what happens if, when Bouchard gets gets ready to play again. Maybe depends on how bad this issue is. We have no idea of that, of course. Mm-hmm. All righty, Bruce. Well, there's no easy easy answers. You need another center, and um, you've got four guys for those two spots once Haas comes back, and those four guys are going to just have to. Hopefully, they can f- finally get two of them. Who are playing well and and i just hope you know if tourists continues in this trend they're gonna have to sit them and and not, like let's not hope that this stretches out where they you know they refuse to do that because he's the veteran signing but um just doesn't have many options i think he would have sat already if he'd had any options but with haas being on the shelf and you know when his other two centers are kara and and uh devon shore you know i mean <sighs> Neither one of those would be would be mistaken for a three C. I mean, that's what they're wanting tourists to be is to be the three yeah. C. I'd play Shore ahead of him next game, like, but I but then you have to play <laughs> Kara. But I'll, you know, so poor JJ Kara. I mean, he just really he he came out there and he was hitting Bruce. But mm-hmm, they um, had three hits. There was one play scoring chance where he turned the puck over just outside the blue line. Yep, um, I remember it well. They finally got the puck out, and he got it about a foot outside his line, and he pushed it back into his own zone and lost possession. Yeah. Um, and Chaos they, ensued. Chaos <laughs> ensued, and they almost, ensued, and they almost scored. All scored. Yeah. Uh, so, J.J.'s, it's the same problem that's plagued him his whole career in terms of puck handling in the defensive zone, making turnovers. And for a four line center, you can't have that. You have to puck protect better and make sure you don't do that. So, and not, yeah, I mean, there was another play where he just lost a kind of a strength battle along the boards. And I'm going, geez, you just can't be doing that. Like, that's got to be your bread and butter, you know, when you're six foot four and 220 or whatever he is, you know, you don't necessarily expect him to win foot races to the puck, but you do expect him to win battles and, you know, and, and pitch battles at close range and just not seeing it. At least I'm not. Maybe it's happening. Let's end it off with just your quick take on Puglia Yarvi. Tonight? Uh, I thought he was pretty average. You know, he had a couple, a couple of moments, but uh, he f- wasn't jumping like he was the other night. And he wasn't anticipating. He took a, a, a bad penalty when they order, the Oilers' penalty kill had basically completely wasted the advantage of their power play by allowing short, you know, Winnipeg power play goals on their first two chances. I think the second one is debatable whether they call it a power play goal or not, but it was a power play goal. The man was just stepping out of the box when it went in the net. And then he took a penalty in the, at the offensive blue line, hooking a guy on the, on the back check when he's got, you know, plenty of support behind him. And Winnipeg gets a third straight or third power play opportunity when they've already scored twice. Like just bad timing to be taking careless penalties. And in fact, the Oilers took all the penalties for the entire rest of the game, which I think there was two, five power plays to two in the end. But whatever, each team got <clears throat> connected early on their first two chances, and then it was an even strength game. Pretty I much pull you thir- after. thirteen minutes into the game. Julio Yarvey took a brilliant backhand feed from McDavid, who, who had charged behind the net. It was the old Messier to Anderson play, yep. their famous play, as yep. my dad always called it, where Messier were at. One or the other would go in as if to take the puck around the net and then flip it out back the other side, and the other one would yep. come trail and put it in. They did the famous the play. Goal and Yarvey, going, huh? Why is the goal well, going on? <laughs> Julio Yarvey should have scored, man. He should have scored on that goal. And I don't... <laughs> You know, I think he's a, I think he's a NHL player. I'm not so sure he's going to be a big time goal scorer in the NHL. His shot is is not uh, fantastic yet. He'll have to work on that at least. But uh, wish he had scored on that one. Obviously, it was so close. He just couldn't raise the puck enough. Yamamoto yeah. raised the puck enough the other the other day to score, and Puliyarvi couldn't do it. 
just kind of shoveled it into the middle of the net when it was, you know, it was a gaping side, but, you know, it's a quick snap of a shot and it's a goal. Yeah. It didn't happen. Some will say it was, he has stick is too long or he's got the wrong lie on his stick. I don't want to go there, but on that particular play, he certainly didn't get the leverage he would have liked on that shot. Let's just leave it at that. I thought he looked fine, Bruce. Although he was, like, yeah, he was all right, like I, he, he wasn't far from the worst player on the ice. I just he didn't have anywhere near the kind of jump he had Sunday. Outside of about two nights, though, uh, where McDavid and Nuge, like the last game against Winnipeg, there hasn't been a, a kind of a magical performance from an Oilers line. I haven't yet seen the, you know, that fantastic chemistry uh, from any, even the top lines. They're playing well. Both those top lines are playing well, but I haven't seen magic yet, except on a couple nights. And um, I thought Drysaddle was was skating hard and fast tonight, but his line just wasn't completely clicking either. And it's just, again, it's yeah. I, it's tantalizing to think of the dynamite line being reunited. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen, but I, I still am tantalized by the prospect of it. And, and with Pulley Arvey playing so well, you know, Pulley Arvey, Kahuna, McDavid would be, a, I think, a decent line. So. Well, I'd like to see a little more out of Cahoon. You know, at some point he needs yeah. to start converting. Scoring. Yeah, Scoring. he's got one point in eight games. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Tonight, I would say, it was probably Yamamoto's weakest game of the season so far. Yeah. He, he was just not as alert around the puck as we've seen. There was one play where the puck, <clears throat> if he, puck went right by him and it was a big mistake by Winnipeg and it could have almost been an open net opportunity and he just wasn't aware of where it was. It just was sort of a symptom of a of a bigger thing that was just he just wasn't on top of his game. And no criticism. You don't expect all the players to play eighty two or fifty six great games in a row. It never happens. But tonight was a night that uh, the support players on Leon's drive on Leon's line <clears throat> weren't uh, uh, really on fire. And as I mentioned before, the player Leon clicked the most with was Cassian. Maybe they should try them together and see if. Uh, if that's something real, because Cassian was skating on to great feeds from Leon. And well, sooner or later, Zach's going to bury one. I mean, the law of <laughs> averages well. says one of them has to go in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All righty. Leave it there. One qu- last question for you. What do you think of Mikko Koskinen's play? Well, 13 grade A chances and five goals. Uh, um that's not great, Bruce. That's not good enough. Um, so I, I didn't see any kind of terrible moments, right. but it's like when you get, when you, when there's that few grade A, like, you know, I could see three goals, four goals, but when you start to get five goals, like just make that big save, make that Especially big save. Especially when you have four goals of support at the other end, five against. Hurts yeah. A bit. Yeah. He was the second, he, and pff, the second best goalie, Halibut, was not good at all. Know, but neither goalie was. Neither was goalie. Team Both team. goalies were weak. But Koskinen. I mean, how many times, Bruce, has Koskinen been the best goalie on the ice this year? Uh, I'm out of the Oilers. Couple? Yeah, probably right. Yeah, mm-hmm. out of their eight games, how many? I would say a couple too. But and um, he needs to be the best goalie sometimes. And he's been okay. There's not been that game. He was okay-ish. Okay. But for the Oilers to been a stolen win by the netminder yet either, right? There has so. not. There has not. Be nice to steal the next, you know, five or ten in a row. <laughs> well, two upcoming uh, against Toronto would be a good place to start. But well, I as the, the old baseball really adage goes, let's get one first. Let's get one first. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Ah, quite the season so far. Yeah, five regulation losses. Those regulation losses pile up fast, man, and, you you know, they're not neutral events. You know, overtime loss is kind of a neutral event, but the orders are just not getting the results in regulation time. It's, you know, three, three out of eight. All righty. Thanks for talking, Bruce. Yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast. <laughs>